Good. Oh, okay. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody got a rubber man on their wrist? No, you need one? Oh, okay. I'll pull my hair back. Hi. Is it this is part for Kevin McDonald's? No. Oh, cool. Oh, well, we were just talking about hair. I haven't just, I just haven't cut it. <laughs> so I saw Barbara, it's time for a haircut because we always get a haircut at the same time. I cut one. It went and got gussied up. You got an understanding when you come in, you get a briefing that says, you are on, 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 uh, you know, notice 24 seven, basically, you know, anytime you're in the facility. You got everybody? Peggy's name. Is Peggy on the phone or coming? Do you know anything? Any information? Okay, she's somewhere. Okay. It got really quiet. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even going to let me bang the, the, the gavel here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, before we call to order, uh, I have Sandra here who is uh, our interpreter and she'll provide information for anybody who might need some language uh, help. Sí, buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación al español, eh, si levanta la mano, yo les puedo alcanzar un receptor de interpretación. Gracias. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, I have a, uh, a young man, a Christian here, who is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you all will uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's take a moment of silence to honor all of our APS graduates uh, who have lost their lives while serving our country.
Thank you. Can I have a roll call, please? Belanda Montoya Cordova? Here. Peggy Mueller Aragon? Lorenzo Garcia? Here. Barbara Peterson? Here. Candelaria Patterson? Here. Elizabeth Armijo? Here. Dr. David Piercy? Here. Uh, and could I have a motion to adopt the August 15th Board of Education meeting agenda and approval of the August 1st, uh, 2018 Board of Education meeting minutes? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. We'll go on to recognition of students and staff community. Uh, uh, board member Yolanda Montoya Cordova. <laughs> Welcome to tonight's board meeting and thank you for coming. Our first recognition will be introduced by Tammy Coleman, Chief Financial Officer. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, for this recognition, I would actually like to ask Sonia Montoya to join me at the podium. Sonia is the Activity Fund Support Department Supervisor and has been instrumental in identifying the individuals for this recognition. <laughs> Tonight we have the honor of recognizing three staff members who achieved an Activity Fund audit with no identified audit findings Earning, or earning their schools, earning for their schools the highest activity fund audit rating possible. A perfect audit. This is very, very unusual. <laughs> School activity funds are subject to the same federal and state laws and district policies as all other fundings. School activities may be of a classroom or extracurricular nature and may include student clubs, student organizations, student publications, and sale of merchandise through a classroom or school store. Three exemplary staff were instrumental in their schools recently receiving a commendable audit rating of their activity fund bookkeeping. What makes these three audits and bookkeepers unique from the many other schools earning commendable audit ratings is that there were no findings identified during these audits. This is a remarkable achievement as activity funds are oftentimes handled by many individuals at a school prior to the bookkeeper's involvement. Additionally, bookkeeping is just one of the one part of the many responsibilities that a bookkeeper position um, manages at these schools. In order to receive a commendable audit, the bookkeeper must successfully navigate bank statement reconciliations, financial reports, activity ledger, accounts, invoices, purchase orders, vouchers, receipts, deposits, inventory logs, just to name a few of the tasks that are required. They have an enormous job. As I call your name, would you please come up to the podium? Ms. Maria Trujillo of Los Padillas Elementary School. Ms. Brenda Getty of College and Career High School. And Ms. Lynn Dayhoff, formerly at Kennedy Middle School, but now in the Human Resources Leaves Office. We're gonna miss her at Kennedy, but we're gonna love her in HR, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you for the exemplary manner, manner that you have handled your activity fund responsibilities so that student activities could successfully continue. Let's show our appreciation for these exceptional staff members. Our next recognition will be introduced by Superintendent Raquel Reedy. I like to say that. 
Good evening, President Piercy, members of the board, community members, and, uh, and staff. Tonight, we have the honor of recognizing several journalists from New Mexico PBS. Since 1958, New Mexico PBS has been a leader in public television with a history of innovative services connecting the people of New Mexico. New Mexico PBS's mission is to inform, engage, educate, and connect New Mexico's diverse communities, reflecting their interests and needs through quality programming, services, and online content that can be accessed anytime and anywhere. Through five channels, including First Nations Experience, PBS Kids, World, and Create, New Mexico PBS reaches more than 700,000 households each week. In fact, it is one of the top 10 most watched public television stations in the country. New Mexico PBS productions have won national and regional awards, including a Peabody Award, a National Emmy, and 40 regional Emmys. Tonight, we celebrate their awards from the Society of Professional Journalists' Top Rocky, Rockies competition. Top of the Rockies is a regional multi-platform contest for reporters and news organizations in an area covering Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. <coughs> the awards were first place in the category of health enterprise reporting with reconnecting with a healthy love style, li lifestyle. <laughs> It was a little slip of the tongue. <laughs> that might have made a very good topic. Uh, <laughs> next year. Okay, second place in the category of ag and environment enterprise with our land, New Mexico's environmental past, present, and future. Third place in the category of public service with DWI recovery courts seek to address root causes of addiction. And two first place State of Change Project awards in the categories of business, enterprise reporting, and public service. Several of the PBS awardees were able to join us this evening. And as I call your name, will you please come up to the podium? And maybe you can stand like, like here. Okay, so um, Jean Grant, New Mexico In Focus host. Hello, how are you? Antonia Gonzalez, correspondent. Sarah Gustavus, producer. Laura Pascas, correspondent. Anthony Rodriguez, production tech. Uh, Kathy Wimmer, associate producer. Anthony Lostetter, studio supervisor. Mm -hmm. Robert McDermott, video production tech. Aaron Senna, video production tech. Joan Rebecchi, uh, director of content. Is it Rebecca? Rebecca. 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 Joan Rebecca, director of content. Franz, uh, Franz uh, Joachim, Joaquin. Joachim, Joachim, Franz Joachim, general manager, and Kevin McDonald, production manager. Kevin, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Just like to thank you for the recognition tonight. Um, we really love what we do at New Mexico PBS, and this uh, these awards I think are especially something that I'm proud of because uh, it's really a focus that is started by producer. Sarah Gustavus, where did she go? Uh, which focuses on a couple of things. One is partnerships. So bringing in people like Laura Paskus to do, as far as I know, the only television series around environmental issues in the state. Um, to Antonia Gonzalez, who's the host of National Native News on Kiwanak Broadcasting, um, to do not only the Reconnecting to a Healthy Lifestyle series that was mentioned there, but also the State of Change um, stories as well. Uh, another focus of ours is to really tell stories in underserved communities through the voices of those people in the communities, but it's also um, about not just pointing out the problems, 
We have far too much of that. So we really want to focus on not only what's going, uh, that needs to be addressed, but people that are using innovation and new strategies to address that. So one of my favorite examples out of these was a story we did for the reconnecting to a healthy lifestyle that was out at, what's the name of the farm there near Flagstaff? Do you guys remember putting it on the spot? Loop Farm. Um, and well, maybe it wasn't even necessarily the farm, but um, <laughs> there is a renovated school bus that is a water filtration system that goes out into the Navajo Reservation, filters and cleans the water, and it's also an educational component where the students learn about the process of that. So that's the kind of innovation and solutions type of journalism that we're really trying to do. And so you can see most everybody on that list is here. There are a couple who are actually still at work taking care of some other things, and there's a bunch of other people that support us in lots of different ways that couldn't be here tonight, but it's a team effort, and we're so thankful for the support of APS and, and the recognition tonight. So thank you very much. I think the beauty of this is that it all comes down to education. You are all educators, and thank you for everything that you do for the community. Isn't that great? So let's show our appreciation for these very real, true journalists. Thank you. That concludes our recognitions. Congratulations again to everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. So we're going to begin with public forum. This is going to be really abbreviated. It's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So whether you're here with a request for the Board of Education to consider, provide information, or just see how the Board of Education operates, we want you to know that you are welcome. The Board of Education has established rules for expected civil behavior during the meeting and public forum. Upon signing in to speak tonight, you received a signature form and copy of the procedural directive, which outlined the rules for the, uh, those rules for expected behavior. The presiding officer will enforce these rules as appropriate throughout the meeting. Tonight, there's only one speaker, so uh, that's gonna be easy. The time remaining to speak will appear on the screen in front of you, and you may not yield your time. Well, there's nobody to yield to. Uh, you are always welcome to submit additional comments to the board in writing. If you are unable to convey your message or you are not able to speak within the 30-minute public forum, the Board of Education encourages you to stay for the entirety of the meeting so you may listen to board member comments before we adjourn. Only at this time may your concerns be addressed at the discretion of each board member. So our one sign-in speaker is Alexis Taylor. First of all, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Alexis Taylor. I'm here on behalf of my son, Reese Taylor. Reese is diagnosed nonverbal autistic. He was attending the Chaparral Special Needs Preschool in the autism specific classroom taught by David Arts. I had to remove my son from the classroom on December 11th, 2017 when he came home with a large bruise on his left ear. 
My husband and I immediately contacted his bus drivers and his classroom. Mr. Arts was not there. So far, I've received two conflicting reports from the administration, one stating that Mr. Arts left early that day and another stating that he was never there at all. The assistant teachers in the room informed me that Reese did not have an injury that they were aware of. We took Reese back to the school and continued to be shocked by them stating that they did not see and were not aware of any injury happening. In their words, he never even cried. They even suggested that he came to school with this bruise that they supposedly never noticed. Speaking with the vice principal, she took us to the nurse's office to complete an incident report since one was never started. My husband contacted APD to make a report as we knew the injury had happened while he was at school. The vice principal told us to go home and they would inform us of the findings of their investigation. Once home, we were contacted by APD and made a report of the incident. Later that night, we were contacted by Detective Gabe Candelario with the Crimes Against Children's Unit. The detective called CYFD and a member of APD's CSI to come to our home. A full investigation was launched by CYFD and APD. We were also asked to go to a UNM child abuse response team exam the detective had set up for us. At the exam, Reese was fully examined. The findings came with the decision that the bruise appeared to be from an adult pinching Reese's ear. Sorry. The doctor told us not to allow Reese to return to the school. She made it very clear that her recommendation was to keep him out of the environment where the abuse happened. Detective Candelaria called and told us to keep him out of school until the investigation was complete. Sorry. The investigator with CYFD also told us to remove him from the school and they advised immediate secondary placement. CYFD called APS requesting the secondary placement. She was told we had to make that request ourselves and they needed more information. I spoke with Allison Owen multiple times and she said she would start on moving him. However, she would have to get approval from her director. After speaking with her director, she told us she can no longer deal with us. Her director, Bernadette Lucero Turner, said Allison was to tell us to call Bernadette and Chaparral. We spoke with Cheryl Wise, the new vice principal of Chaparral, multiple times starting in January. She was completely unaware of the situation and informed us there was no incident report. After quite a bit of back and forth, she also agreed to give my son a secondary placement. Unfortunately, Bernadette once again said we couldn't move him and needed to have a meeting to discuss this further. We tried to attend this meeting, but when we showed up that day, Cheryl Wise was not on campus and the office had no knowledge of that meeting. We called her. She apologized and said she had forgotten to call us to cancel. We later found out that the director was at school. However, she went to a conference room and didn't inform any staff that she was on campus. While there, we asked for a list of all APS personnel who were in contact with Reese on that date. We were told because of the ongoing investigation, that request had to go through APS's lawyers and HR department. To this day, we still haven't received that information. Throughout this ordeal, we have repeatedly informed faculty that we are following recommendations of APD, CYFD, and UNM's CART department. The faculty told us that since there was no proof that it happened there, there was no need for a secondary placement. Even asking for a temporary placement until the investigation was complete has been denied. We were informed by Bernadette that she needed a copy of my son's CART exam, which is a direct violation of HIPAA, and a copy of the detective's report, which isn't even available to us since it's still an open investigation. However, at this point, we no longer have any faith in her actually helping our son. Because of all of this, Reese has gotten no therapy since December 2017 and he has regressed to the point where he has lost most of the progress he made from early intervention long before we set foot in Mr. Art's classroom. Our only intent this entire time has been for Reese to be given a secondary placement so he can continue receiving the education and therapy he needs in a safe environment. Due to all of this, his IEP is now expired and we don't feel like he, like we will ever be able to get him the help that he needs. If it helps, we've brought pictures of the injury as well as a copy of Alexis, that exam. Alexis, it's way beyond the time that we have, but I think if you would get a hold with our staff, we can take care of your, your issues here, okay? Thank okay, you. no, very much. Thank you very much for your information.
Thank you for your input. <clears throat> okay, we'll go on with the superintendent's report. Thank you. <clears throat> President Piercy, board members, community members, and staff, the majority of schools started Monday, including our newest school, Tres Volcanes Community Collaborative School, where 600 students were excited to start the year using uh, blended learning techniques and focusing on technology. Throughout the district, 84,000, uh, the district's 30, um, 84,000 students, 142 schools, and over 6,000 teachers, we all focused on getting to know one another and begin learning together. The enthusiasm across the district was absolutely contagious. Uh, and the fact is that it was probably one of the smoothest starts that we have had in a very, very long time. And all that preparation and hard work by the staffs and the schools and the departments that offered support uh, really paid off. And I thank them for that from the bottom of my heart. I'm also thankful for all the people who have donated school supplies, helping to provide tools students need to learn. One tradition of gathering supplies specifically comes to mind. The Corporate Volunteer Council of New Mexico, made up of many organizations across the city, filled a city bus with school supplies that will help thousands of our students this school year. It is one illustration of how the community steps up to help students succeed. With a nationwide teacher shortage, we've done some creative things to fill teaching positions this year. We have left no rock unturned. In addition to working with colleges and universities, holding job fairs and recruiting across the country, we have also recruited from other countries. We've hired 33 teachers from the Philippines and more teachers coming will be coming in January. And we've also hired six Spanish teachers from Spain to help alleviate that shortage. We're still looking for about 125 re regular education teachers and 160 special education teachers. Substitutes currently are filling these vacancies. Together with the help of the community and our education partners, we will continue to work to provide learning opportunities for all of our students and find the best teachers for the children. That concludes superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Reedy. We'll go on to special issues. Uh, a is the consideration ratification of the negotiated agreement between the Board of Education and the Albuquerque Municipal School District Number 12 and the Albuquerque Sectoral Clerical Association. It's a discussion action. And uh, Todd Torgerson, Chief Human Resources of Legal Support Services, and Karen Rudis, Executive Director of Human Resources, will present to us. Good evening, board, Superintendent Reedy, <coughs> uh, board president, Dr. Piercy, and members of the board, the district, and Carla Montano, president, and Yvonne Rodriguez would like to request ratification of the tentative agreement for the Secretary Clerical Association. Yeah. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. Another year has gone by, and we're still here. My name is Carla Montano. I'm president of the ASCA, Albuquerque Secretarial Clerical Association. Uh, to my right is Yvonne Rodriguez. She's no stranger to the district, worked 40, 45? 40, 43. 43 years and was president how many years? Well, from 1986 to 2009. <laughs> so we're still at it. And um, I just want to thank you all um, for having us tonight. Um, hope you're all having a great evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to stand up here and thank Karen Rudis. Um, works wonderful with us. And I want to tell you a little bit about our negotiations. We got 3.5 for the unit, which there are 434 in there that we represent. Uh, we also got a special level, level four. Uh, that way they there's somewhere else to go other than level three. Uh, they're very hardworking. I want to acknowledge all of them. They're the first face you see when you walk in the school. They work hard and they're very skilled people. Uh, we did clean up in language. Um, what else did we do? Well, that 
that was about okay. it because it wasn't a full contract. So. Yes. <laughs> so anyhow, thank you for having us. Um, if you have any questions, we're here. Hopefully we can answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Uh, board members, any questions at all? Board Member Muller again. So I know you said you represent 434. Is that total secretary cler clerical, correct? Right. Um, so how many of them, of those 434, are dues pain members? Um, right now it's about 120. Okay. And then, I, I mean, I, would, I read the, the whole um, agreement and um, one of the things that I saw is that you get um, your secretaries and clerical get credit for working outside of APS. So does that place them on a higher on the salary schedule based on their outside work outside of APS? Yes, board member uh, Peggy Mueller Aragon. If they come in with outside experience directly related, they will move on the steps on the longevity uh, in regards to their placement on the salary schedule. And then which how, helps as far as right. How do you verify recruiting. that just by their previous we have, employment? Uh, well, no, we request an EDC and the HR department sends out its own form and that has to come from the prior employer. And it is sometimes really difficult to get those back if their archives have been purged. So we do our best. Sometimes we need to even get W-2s from past employers, but it's pretty standard in the field. So okay. we, we get those for all, the, all employee groups actually. Great. And then um, one of the things I was looking at, and it didn't kind of go into detail, is when there's a reduction in force, you say that you negotiate the procedures for that. So what, what is that process? Look we like. have unfortunately had to do that several times in the last 10 years. And so it's uh, clarified, we've been through it, but first we have to look at seniority in all of that employee group. And then we meet with everybody who's least senior. And a couple, when six years ago we did it, we got all of them in a room and we of course froze hiring for those positions. And then we tried to place them in other positions. And at the end of the day, um, we didn't, cut as many, some chose to retire, but we do have an outline process for that. Okay. And then I was looking at the definition of like family. So in the, for the bereavement leave, it includes, you know, many people, you know, to aunts and uncles and grandparents, et cetera. But then when it came to caring for, you know, if you have a family member that's ill, then that's limited to, you know, children, spouse, et cetera. So why is that different than it is for the teacher? Because I saw that it's different for the teachers. We are just in the process of outlining and clarifying all of the leaves language. So we've sat down with lawyers and the, the unions to do that. But we are following FMLA guidelines for that specifically care of a family member. So that's why it's different in this contract. But uh, we are in the process of aligning everything at this moment, so that will be cleared up. Okay, and then one of the things that you have on the revised language under the Memorandum of Understanding is that an orientation tax force will be put into place. So has that, that is going to be starting this year then? Yes, Board Member Mueller Aragon, we're rather excited about that because Lynn Dayhoff, one of the wonderful secretaries we just recognized, is now working with us to support that. And we're collaborating on what secretaries need uh, when they're new hires to the district. We're working with finance on that. They did have a big training at the beginning of this year, but we're trying to incorporate some other aspects of their job, of their job into that orientation. Okay. And then I know there was a stipend for bilingual. Um, which I personally don't think is a whole lot. I mean, it says that you shall have a stipend 50 cents more an hour paid twice a year. So how does that work? I, I, mean, I was just confused about what that meant exactly based on how many hours twice a year. I... Um, that was increased last year and it works because uh, if they're moving around and if they discontinue those services, we pay it twice a year. So it's added to their base salary rate. Okay. But that is something that we can negotiate. <laughs> okay. So it, it, then the stipend is part of their pay, so it will be 
part of their pension. I mean, it will be all part of that, though it's not separated. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. I think that's. I, I mean, I just know secretaries. You're the first face that our families see. Um, you guys know everything that's going on at the schools. Yeah. I, I think that you are wonderful. I personally think that you are terribly underpaid, in my opinion. Um, I'm sorry for that because if you have a wonderful secretary, the climate is wonderful just because because of the people that are up at the front. So I just want to thank you for that. And as a teacher, I just always held you all to the highest regard. So thank you. You're welcome. Any There's some comments? very skilled people. I'm sure that you all noticed with the ladies that they were commending. You know, with the um, with the audits, it takes a big skill. And uh, so anyhow, thank you so much for, for that compliment. Yes, we appreciate it. Do you have anything to say? Other comments? No. Or Mayor Peterson? I'm glad for once that things weren't frozen. It's still not enough for what you do, but it's at least something and moving in the right direction. So thank you for everything that you all do. You're welcome. We're still low. <laughs> Yes. We lost eight years. Yes. So um, mm -hmm. even though it's very positive, uh, we're still behind. Mm -hmm. But and we're hoping for better times. <laughs> and when we talk about, and this is true for every employee group, when we talk yeah. about attracting new people, it's one thing, but we've got to retain experienced people. And if we don't treat people right, we can't retain them. So thank you for hanging in for all these years. You're welcome. Other comments? Do I have a motion? I move for approval. Do I have a second? second? We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Woohoo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to the item B consideration for ratification of a negotiated agreement between the Board of Education and Albuquerque Municipal School District Number 12 and the Educational Police Officers Association. Discussion action. And the same folks are here to help us with that. Board President Dr. Piercy, members of the board, I would like to present the Police Educators Association tentative agreement for ratification tonight. And Roy Dennis, president of the group, couldn't be here. However, I have the Chief of Police, Steve Gallegos, here to answer any questions. Any Anything magna magnanimous here other than you did get a raise? We, we know that. And we thank you. Or they thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anything. Good process, and uh, we appreciate everything that was done. Thank you, Karen. Okay. And uh, thank you. Good. Okay. Other comments at all from I the board? Just, I just have one. Board Member Patterson. Oh, yeah, if you, somebody just left me. Okay. Board Member Patterson. All right. Um, you indicated, uh, you know, it shows that there's 120 hours. Um, <laughs> If you work 120 hours, it's considered overtime. Where did that figure come from? I couldn't find it in here. What was the starting point? Is there a change with regard it, to it that? It was 200 last year. It was 200. So we talked about that in various uh, times this year. And it's roughly 30 days of comp time. <coughs> and what happens is then they're not there if they have that much comp time accrued. And we're, we have such a deficit and we haven't been able to fill police officer positions, it's easier just to pay the overtime once they're over 120. But um, it, we can change it back to 200. It's really not a big deal for us. It's just that then we don't have anybody if they've accrued that much comp time. Okay. And, and then my other question is with regard to the uniform. So as a new recruit, you come in and you pay maybe two, three hundred, four hundred dollars for your uniform. And I noticed that they get reimbursed over 26, uh, pay, over 26 pay periods. And it's only fifteen dollars. Is there any way to do this up front? Give them maybe half of that for the uniforms? Yes, Mo uh, Board Member Patterson, we did that in the past. We did uh, upfront the money to the incoming people. However, if they didn't stay long enough for us to recoup that money, we were out that money. So we do it in, in installments. No clawback on that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, and you know, if you do the 200, you know, you, it's a good faith effort to start that way. I, it is, and I wish we could do it a lot easier. But again, it, we we just were losing too much money when they weren't staying with us. And so they get $15 a pay period. Um, as a reimbursement over one year, which 
uh, after it accumulates, <coughs> I mean, you've got four hundred dollars. Yes. All right. All right. Just checking. Thank you. Any other comments, Board Member Peterson? Just um, one question. I, you know, one of the things that's always in contracts is due process rights and and you know really writing writing out and being specific about what due process looks like. But I'm curious, do you have any long-term goals for what kinds of support the officers in our schools needs? What, what training is either desired or given? Or if there's anything long range that you see should be in the contract in the future? Well, they're mandated. We're mandated by mm -hmm. by the state to have certain, mm -hmm. and they mandate mm -hmm. what training that, that they have. We have during the year. Uh, for, it's a two-year cycle. We add to that, uh, and that's where that type of training mm -hmm. comes in. It it all depends. Like right now, it's active shooter training, uh, security at the schools, that sort of thing. So we we throw that in as well. So there's also the mandated training by by Santa Fe, but it, there's is a long-term. Uh, training that we do, whether it be child abuse training, uh, uh, update lo uh, law laws that change during the the session, um, a lot of his mental health. That's a big one. That's ongoing for, for it. Just goes on and on and on. So we continue that training. Uh, we update it uh, annually, and we continue on. We mandate what our officers have as well as Santa Fe. And that's why we appreciate you all so much and why the officers that are in the schools do such a good supportive job for our students and staff. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Board Member Muller again. So um, Chief Guy goes, how many police officers are there covered under this agreement? How At many this do? time we have 54 officers uh, within our department. Okay. And how many, how many are dues paying? Well, there's also CSAs in the bargaining unit as well. Right. So op okay. Yeah. I don't know that. Uh, the union people, uh, that's through the union, so I don't know how many of them pay dues. Okay. But I can get that information tomorrow for you. Okay. If, if I know, I mean, for the CSAs and for the police officers, I would just like to know how many there are and how many are dues paying. And then I just want to um, say thank you. I, I, I was reading something, and I thought this was... It touched my heart. It said, the primary purpose, purpose of employee evaluation shall be the improvement of performance, which is what it should be, and I appreciate that because that's what we should all be trying to do for every job here in APS. I think that's really important. Um, the um, one thing, I was looking at the annual leave that you can accrue 10 to 22 days, I guess, based on the years, right? Is that how you do the first year you have this many and then it just kind of goes up. Is that how that's done? There's two calendars. So the CSAs work a 183-day calendar, and that's the 10-day accrual. And then year-round officers work the 256. So that's, that's the 22 the that days. Can... That's why it differ. OK. And then the sick leave, they can accrue up to like 10 days. And that's is that for everyone as well, or is it based on the number of days you're in your contract? It's based on the number of days, hours you work. OK. and. How, where did that come from? Is that just what like APD does and the sheriff's department? How do you decide that? For leave Those accrual? numbers for the leave, right. It's a district practice. And 10 days is pretty much uh, a standard, 10 to 22 days, two weeks for year round. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I was looking at that kind of surprised me is when I was looking at degrees like if you have an associate's degree you'll get added 10 cents to your hourly rate like give me a break uh, a bachelor's degree 15 cents an hour and a master's degree 20 cents an hour I mean you're trying to make yourself better and learn more and we're like a school district and that is what we do for people that I mean take care of our kids and take care of us and I so appreciate police officers I think you guys, I mean, the secretaries have a different job. You guys have something else to do that is as important, keeping our kids safe. And that just, that just pains me. It, but you guys are my heroes, you know, so. And I, I, I'm sure the union thanks you for that because they do come to the table wanting to push more for <laughs> degrees. And I understand that. It's something that I think is positive and we should continue to work forward to do that. And that's, and every year they come up with that. And, and I understand and, and we're going to work 
little hard. Well, I, uh, Chief Gallegos, for an a APD, how, what do they do? Like when you come out, you have an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, what is their pay increase for each of those levels of education? It is quite a bit more. I, yeah, I don't know, I know the exact figures, but it's quite a bit more. Right, okay. We just need to do something, because, I mean, everybody, I mean, we look up to you, and the kids look up to you, and I just think we should do better. We'll definitely work on that part of it. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments? I'll uh, entertain a motion. Second. Oh, I'll move for approval. Uh, do I have a second? second. It's a motion and, uh, and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it greatly. We're going to item C, the consideration and ratification of the negotiated agreement between the Board of Education, Albuquerque Municipal District 12, and the Albuquerque Teachers Federation. And we have our same presenters here, so. Yes, and um, Ellen Bernstein definitely wanted and planned to be here. <laughs> However, she was subpoenaed to testify in the lawsuit in Santa Fe today, so she did mention she was running late, and I thought she would make it, but she hasn't shown up yet. So I'll move forward. Uh, President Dr. Piercy, board members, the union and the district would like to request ratification for the tentative agreement with the teachers bargaining unit. Uh, anything special that you want to bring up here? We've worked on a lot of different things this year. It was uh, an exceptionally well bargaining team for both, both members and we felt really good about that. Ellen mentioned several times with finance that this was the best year ever. It, we haven't negotiated raises in a long time, but when we did in the past, this was probably the best year we ever uh, worked together on it. And we collaborated on this new salary matrix because um, the old one was outdated, it was broken, and in the past some board members were concerned with the steps because there were inequities among steps. So we have moved forward in um, correcting those, those errors, but it, it's gonna take more changes in the future. So we are looking at that. We're also considering other ways to look at pay as far as um, uh, credentials and how we do stipends and all those things because we do a lot of differentials and statements for little things, but perhaps we need to refocus on how we're looking at that, and um, as well as the duty day. So we had a lot of really productive conversations around those types of things, and um, otherwise the language is, speaks for itself, I think. If you have any specific questions, I can answer them. Okay, uh, board members, do you have specific questions? Um, yes, board member Patterson. Okay, uh, under the evaluation performance, uh, page 10, uh, you know, historically, I guess uh, PED has always been included in part of this performance evaluation. How do you select the members that look at this performance evaluation? I believe there's three people that are selected. And how's that selection made? And who makes the selection? Okay, so that's part of the, um, the process for evaluating teachers and in par once they're on an improvement plan. Let me see. Are you referring to A1? Let me just clarify what it. It's, it's, it, it's part of the performance evaluation, Article 5. Okay, I'm Article on Article 13. Five? Article 5. Article 5 on page maybe, 13. Maybe I have it. On page maybe. 10. Is it page 10? I think it's That's Article 13. Yeah. My hand just wrote something out. Yeah. I think it's Article 13. Mm -hmm. article. Yeah, article it's Article 13. 13. Oh, okay, there you go. Thank you. Right. For the Thank question. you. Okay. So we're following the PED language on how we evaluate them, but as far as, are you looking at A4, employees assigned to two, to two or more schools? Yeah. How we're deciding that? We've been doing uh, evaluations jointly or one principal can select or the teacher can select. So we've sort of let the teacher drive that decision because one can only be entered into new, the, t the PED website. Okay, so the teacher can actually make that selection as to who they want? Yes. All right, that's good, yeah. all right. Then my other question it relates to the task force that you have um, related to high school. Oh. And it's, uh, it's talking about the schedule that you've, you've
put a task force together to address the schedule at the high schools. Could it's you talk a little bit about that? Yes, what that's about is um, currently high school, you have to have so many credits to graduate from high school. But by the time seniors get to their senior year, they've already pretty much <coughs> covered most of their credits. So their senior year, they're rarely on campus full time. The union would like to um, make sure that those kids remain on campus more of their day. So we're looking at how those credits would be considered. I know partial credit has been part of that conversation. So we're gonna create a task force with a curriculum and instruction and look at those senior schedules and what's happening with them. And so, um, so if you have a senior who has only one class, how are you gonna keep that senior in class? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> If they've met all the credits, I mean, it's a very difficult uh, situation here. Well, and, and requiring them to have more credits isn't the answer. Right. Mm -mm. Uh, so <laughs> that's going to take a lot of conversation. Yeah, it, employment. And maybe, maybe what we need is stakeholders. Um, maybe we need a conversation with the, the parents as well, and maybe. We could include them in that task yes, force. Absolutely. That's a great idea. Yeah, and I'm sure would. Ellen would appreciate that. Okay. So. And I think they may have some ideas, because they'd like to see their students at school. And perhaps some students, too. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Great idea, thank you. you bet. Other comments? I, I just have one. Board member Yalaga. <clears throat> An article five on the conditions of professional service. Um, in the section, I think it's number 10, it says, if a high school teacher anticipates that any student is failing at a semester. I was just curious about like the word if. <laughs> so I mean, so I was wondering why it wasn't when a high school teacher anticipates that a student's because it just seems like there was like, uh, it, it was left up to like, you know, uh, interpretation. So, I mean, it just, it just kind of, it just stuck out at, for me at that one. It's like, so if a teacher thinks so. Um, and then I wasn't clear on what does it mean by this is a non-binding, and in, uh, this, is, this list is non-binding and intended for planning purposes only. So it just means that the list that a teacher identifies students that are potentially failing, it's just a list for planning purposes. It doesn't mean that they are indeed failing or well, if the teacher grades something in the, after that date of the list, okay. they can change it. Okay. But we did add that language several years ago because we, the, we need to have that for graduation purposes, and some teachers were waiting to the 11th hour, and then, then they, didn't, they weren't supposed to graduate it, yet we thought they were graduating. So that language has helped. The if hasn't been an issue okay. since that point, but <laughs> just, it just struck probably me as sloppy writing there. <laughs> And then I just, I just want to say um, I love the idea on the memorandum of understanding for the advisory uh, for the task force to structure uh, the purpose of the advisories for the middle and high schools because I think that's very much needed at that point in terms of I think there's a lot that can be done with advisories if they're really meaningful and there's a lot of engagement for students about what, what we're doing with that, with that advisory time. Part of the rationale for, to revisit that too is because we've had them in place for seven years or so now, but we've realized that high schools are doing it differently from middle schools, which it makes sense, but we want to revisit that topic and, and sort of review what we're doing. And those are the only comments I had. Thank you. Other comments? Others? Board Member Miller, you got it? Okay, same question. How many teachers and then how many are dues paying members? Teachers 60, well, teachers and everybody covered the, by the bargaining unit is 68.99 last count, and 15.74 voted. I don't have the union paying members right now, but I can get those, I'll get those to every, the board tomorrow on for all the bargaining units. Okay, I appreciate that. And then I, to go to what Member Patterson had kind of, that was one of the things that I had seen about keeping those seniors there. I personally think that when you're trying to keep somebody there that worked really hard, they got everything done quickly. I mean, if we have kids that can get all their courses done by the time they're, you know, juniors, I mean, we're punishing them by trying to keep them there. Some high school, some kids are not meant to be in high school. They just excel out in the workforce or in colleges. And high school is just not for every kid. And so I just have a hard time trying to keep somebody there who did everything that they were supposed to do. And now we want to tell them, well, yeah, you did everything, but we still want to keep you here. I just have a really hard time with that. I just know too many students that want to get 
they, they just want to get out of high school. It's a tough time for a lot of kids. And if they can do it, Karen, I think we should, we should reward them, mm -hmm. give them their diploma, and mm -hmm. let them well, go on. And that is why we wanted to have a task force, because there were differing views. And, but we're always willing to collaborate and, and have the, the difficult conversation around those things. So. OK. And then um, I was looking at the middle school differentials, and so it was going to be, even if it was a smaller school, that they were still going to have, it was on page 7 under the new language, Article 6, um, that they were going to, every middle school was going to receive five differentials, so it's not going to be based on the size of the school. And what was the rationale for that? Because they still have those positions. Even in those small schools, it doesn't mean we eliminate that position. So in all fairness, they deserve that differential as well. Okay. Um, and then... I was just kind of confused about one of these. Let me see if I find it. Um, I'm probably not going to find it. It was talking about that there was they were going to change the hours. I can't remember of exactly who it was, and I don't have it written. I, I just wrote myself a little note, but they weren't going to get a, a loss of pay, but they were going to be working less days, and I can't remember who it was. Who was that? Was it the yes, diagnostician? Yes, it's the uh, diags, okay. correct. So um, we didn't need them working that many, that long into the summer, because then the students are gone, and, and they've been able to do the job. I mean, it is a busy, busy job, but we thought that would be a good way to give them a boost in salary, because they are drastically underpaid as a group as well. And um, that was the rationale for changing that. We have talked about doing that for several years. And we finally thought that this year, with the change in the, ske the salary schedule that we made and the raise and the changes that we've sort of made all over, it made sense to make that move this year. So it wasn't going to affect our students in any way, though? No, no, not at all. OK. Um, and then, um, I know you, there were some task forces that you're going to be doing on the schedule, et cetera. Is that at like basically, is that at like no cost? Because I think there was like three different task forces, right? Are you asking so there, if the task force cost any? Is there any cost? No cost? There isn't any cost, right? OK. Um, and then, sorry, I had a lot of questions. That's OK. I know one of the things I was looking at was when it was talking about um, an Article 2 and it was talking about um, professional association fees and licensure fees that they'll be reimbursed for. Is this done for all employees that belong to different associations? Is this because I just think we need to be fair. This applies to the people that are covered in this teaching the contract by the teacher contract. It doesn't apply to other employees and other bargaining units. But they are treated in similar ways. Okay. That that was my question. I know we're just talking about about the teachers and cover, who's covered, but I just wanted to make sure that the same thing held true for, for others as well. Yes. Um, and let's see. Um, one of the things I was looking at is I was looking at some of the differentials for like the coaches and then I saw like football. I'm not a big football fan, no offense to everybody who is, but I saw them get paid a whole lot more and then I, the cheerleading coaches as well. And I mean, I'm like yay for cheerleaders, but I mean, they cheer us on. Um, but I just kind of wondered how do you come up with who gets paid more? Is it by how many kids are on their team? We talked about that a lot this year because we looked at the differentials and we actually changed that. If you notice the a band, few of them, right? the, With the, the choir band, band the choir, choir and, and band and music. And historically, the football uh, mm. stipend was because it's so it's so much more time intensive and the the season is longer and that's how it evolved. However, uh, marching band is equally a lot of time and work because they attend those football games and that's why we distinguished, made that difference in the contract. Um, so that was part of this bigger conversation that we're talking about as well on how do we look at all these differentials long term and try and create some equity among these positions based on time. And then we also talked about 
you know, what about these teams that make it to, uh, you know, they keep winning, which is more time too. <laughs> right. And some other districts actually do it based on the size of the teams and if they're a winning team, like Texas has this down. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're looking like, we're looking at different options for that long term as well. I, I think that we need to, because the sports, you know, if your child's playing tennis, that, or you're on the tennis team, that's as important to you as if you're on the football team. And it all keeps and it students seems, in school. Uh, I just, I just didn't get that. I still don't, I still don't get it. So I just think we need to look at that better because it looks like we're saying something is, this is sport is more important because we're paying this coach more. Exactly. And that should never be the case because every sport should be as important as the next one. So, um, and then I just had a question on, um, who's the swim team mom? About the Federation training workshops and conventions, and it said there'll be 40 professional leave days at full pay by the district. How much does that cost us? Um, well, most, with this bargaining group, group, nothing, because none of them are full-time teachers. Okay. So they do that on their own time. That's a good thing. Um, and then I was looking at um, it's on page 19, it's with all the pretty different colors on here, and it was talking about the career pathway system for the three-tier licensure system. So they'll be able to move from one job to another, another job. Is that basically without any reduction in their current compensation level? So that doesn't matter if they, if they were getting paid a lot more being a social worker, or interpreter, or whatever, and then they come down to becoming a teacher, or not come down, because that's not coming down. This they change positions to become a teacher. So then what, I just want to understand that. So board me member Miller, Mueller Aragon, I'm sorry about. Uh, what this was referring to is we've had a lot of teachers that want to become counselors, and in the past they had to then start at level one as a counselor, if even if they were a level three <coughs> teacher. So that was, in, we want to retain people in the district and if people want to change in their job and you know, that might bring them some longevity and revive them, we want to do that. So this is going to allow those role groups to keep their salary as they move to the career pathway, which was created when the PED started the three-tier system. It didn't apply to anybody outside of a teacher role group. So we created the career pathway to give them a way to advance as well. That would be similar. Um, but we found that that is impeding the process of movement in the district and we're losing people. Some people are leaving because they can go be a counselor in another district at 40,000 where they would have to start at level one at 34,000. So this allows them to move within groups and retain that same salary. And it's really at no cost to the district because we'd be paying them either way. Paying them, whatever. Yes. So this was productive language. Okay, and I just um, think as long as if, you know, everybody kind of agreed and thought that was a, that was a good thing. Um, and then let me see. I have all of them dog-eared so I can get to the pages. Um, well, I'm hoping Ellen walks in any minute too. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Simon's here. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, um, sorry about my tardiness. Um, Dr. Bernstein would have loved to have been here. She might walk in at any moment, but she's coming from Santa Fe. She's coming from court. So court uh, lasts uh, considerably longer than she'd anticipated. So I do apologize, but, uh, but yeah. All right. Okay. Um, oh, and yeah. then, oh, I apologize. Okay. Um, yeah. um, just, uh, just as a couple words, I think um, that Ellen wanted me to uh, convey is that uh, we, the as part of the negotiating team, um, we felt very strongly that there was a great spirit of collaboration. Uh, we got ahead of the game and we were able to come up with salaries that was very helpful for employees. Um, Tammy Coleman and her team, Teresa Scott, were uh, instrumental in that. And just in general, the district was uh, a great in collaborating and coming up with solutions uh, to a lot of the problems that we're talking about today. And uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the I have trouble with this for every um, everyone is just when there's a reduction in force that you bring back the, not necessarily the best person, but you bring back whoever was out last. And so I, I, have, I just personally have, have trouble with that one. And then the other one just for um, 
elementary teachers who I think are the most awesome. Um, we have to, as elementary teachers, had to teach like every subject. I mean, we had to teach everything. We had to do that. And I know here it says that secondary teachers can't be required to teach more than in three different subject areas. But I just want to point out that elementary teachers are, you know, we do it all. So just, it, it's, it's, it's a hard job to be able to be good at teaching everything. So I just want a shout out to the elementary teachers. Um, then uh, also for the leaves, so you basically were explaining that to me, why it was kind of different between this one and is this basically how it is pretty much across the country is when you have leave to take care of a sick relative, then that mostly teachers will get to basically take care of. I'm just wondering how that would, how that would work, like having their days off to be able to take <laughs> care of someone when there's that many people on the list. Uh, correct. The we have to follow FMLA guidelines, step one. So that's 12 weeks, and if you have enough sick time accrued, you should be able to tie, be able to use that time up for a loved one. So that's what every employee in the district can do. And coverage is an issue, but... I mean, I'm just worried about, I mean, I just know when I've had a rough year where I, there's been many illnesses and deaths in a family where it's a whole bunch of people, how that, in turn would affect a classroom full of children. So if you have um, a mom who's sick and you stay home and then your dad passes away and then your uncle's sick and you can take care of him, the impact that that would have on a classroom is my concern. So I know that doesn't happen all the time, but I can think of in my situation where it's been a whole lot of people where and it's like one thing after another after another and my concern is just what's happening to the kids. Yes, we have to take everything into consideration, but we can't violate FMLA is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that the state's working on a paid family leave act and that there's a task force in place and perhaps that would help address it if that passes. Yeah, I just, I, just, I just worry about the kids in the classroom and how not having their teacher there, we know how important it is to have that teacher in the classroom every day. So that's, that's what I'm concerned about. And then, of course, the other one that is disturbing to me is just, I think we're the only government entity right now in New Mexico, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, but that still pays people that are holding political office. So, I mean, that's at a cost to taxpayers where they're you know, getting paid their salary, and then they leave the classroom and then they're, um, we're ha we have a, to have a substitute in there, and then they're getting their per diem. And so I just think that is not something that, um, that we should do. And I know that like the state and the city doesn't do that. And I think that um, we should take the lead there also um, when it comes to that. So that is my opinion as well. Um, let me see, I might be. And just, um, I, and this is just from talking to um, a lot of people in and around my district, I am a big, I, I think teachers do an amazing, most of them, not all of them, do an amazing job. And the great teachers should get paid a whole lot more than the mediocre teachers and then the poor teachers. Um, and we still haven't figured out exactly how, how to do that. And to say we're all great is, is untrue because they're not all great doctors or all great lawyers. And we look for a great doctor and we look for a great lawyer. And our kids are the most important people in the world. So we should be making sure that all of our children are being taught by the very, very best and that we are moving out those who are not the very best. I also don't believe when we're looking at the Janus decision and what's gonna happen there is teachers are professionals. I always thought of myself as a professional and we should have a professional organization and not, not a union. We should be like the American Medical Association, the Bar Association, that's what I think and that's what, how I look at teachers. I think that that's what we are and that us having 
a union that bargains for us is not where I think it should be and not where a lot of people out there think it should be. So that's it. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I'd like, uh, I'm I, not we're done. not done with. <laughs> I do get a chance to speak once. <laughs> I get a chance if, if it's time still. Okay, Barbara. Um, one of the things that's remarkable about this contract is how much it supports professional practice. And there is absolutely no system that I've ever seen and that research seems to bear out that somehow arbitrarily rewarding one person over another is not what makes for the strongest teaching force, but that what's in place in this contract really focuses on how do you give professional support because not every child's going to be in the best teacher's classroom. The goal is really to guarantee that every single teacher in a building is a good teacher and has the support that they need. And it, and it seems like this contract really takes not just the economic part of what it is to be a, an APS employee, but really looks at the professional side as well between the PAR, the mentorship, um, the differentials even, because those go to people who are fulfilling leadership positions and they're elected by the people who know who they are and they know that they're the real leaders, instructional leaders in a building and step up and do the extra work. And so I really want to thank, thank the team, not just for this contract, but I think all of the contracts for guaranteeing that there's equity across bargaining units and it was no small task. I know because I've seen the budget along with everyone else that it was not an easy job. I do have I do have a separate question. We are not seeing the EA's contract. What's the status of the EA's contract? Um, we had a lot of difficulty scheduling negotiations this year and we wanted to, uh, with the new bus driver union being created, we wanted to focus on that first because it's the same president. Kathy Chavis is the president of both the EA and the bus driver union now. So we are working with them and then we're going to do the EA contract which will be f rather quick. So those are the next ones that are coming to the board in the next month or two. Okay. In terms of the compensation, and the salary increases, will they go into effect immediately? Yes, we already agreed to that. Okay. So that we could roll them over with the beginning of the contract year. Okay. And so we'll see sometime in the coming weeks. Yes, stay that tuned. That contract. Um, I know one of the things that really is a huge step forward is being allowing people to move laterally from one position to another because you will never convince me that a teacher of 20 years isn't going to be a more effective counselor if they if they make that move. They don't forget what they know about kids and schools when they do those kinds of lateral moves. And so, I think it's I think it's huge um, and and much needed to to maintain people. Now we just need the state to recognize it for people who move into the ranks of administration, because the effort by the state is their solution is to say, well, you should only have to teach for three years and then you can become a principal. And anyone who's been in a building knows that those are not going to be the strongest administrators and that somehow we've got to make it, if we want real instructional leaders in, in administrative positions, people need to be able to take that lateral move. But that's outside the realm of this contract. That's a legislative issue. And so thank you for the work. Thank you. Other comments? Board Member Garcia. Well, I want to appreciate the collaborative effort because I think this could have gone sour at any particular turn. Um, and I think because of your integrity and determination to keep us moving forward, um, it did. It did move forward. Um, I have a question. So it's a general question, more for imp information. So if you have someone who is not a member of your bargaining unit but uh, has an issue, a grievance, do you represent that uh, individual? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we are required to represent them individually. Um, if um, the individual, ha you know, we cannot discriminate based on membership status. Okay, so that's an obligation that you have and you right. carry out. 
That is correct, yeah. Do you have any idea how many people who are not members of your union you've represented over the past period of time? Me individually? Rep well, uh, I'm just curious in general. I, yeah, I, I represent, um, I have been to representational meetings of folks that are not members on a number of occasions. Um, for anyone having any sort of employment action, um, meaning like, you know, if somebody's going to be uh, placed on an improvement plan, I have personally represented them whether they are members or not. So why do you think these people will turn to you as a union to represent them? Well, that's a great question. I think uh, they see the utility of it, um, especially when it considers uh, when uh, employment actions are being considered against them. So it sounds to me like they, they believe that you will look out for them and be a voice and advocate. That is correct, yes. Okay, thank you. I think that's important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one concern I have, and, and I don't know, Karen, uh, or yourself, sir, if you're able to comment on this, is uh, how are we doing in terms of livable wages uh, in, in terms of this contract? <laughs> Not good, to be honest. Um, we recently went to Houston to a job fair, and we tried to recruit some ancillary staff in particular, and they were all making 58000 as a new hire, and they were going to have to move over here and make you know, 20000 less. So uh, we are still not competitive nationally. The 34, the 36,000 as a start rate is just awfully low. It's hard to recruit people as a new hire here. We can get them if they're gonna come in as a level two or a level three, but as a new hire, it's, it's just too low. How about in terms of our EAs? I know we're not talking about EAs. The EAs are more, com we're more competitive statewide with the EA salaries. And um, they also have a career ladder, so they are able to move forward in that respect. And they, a lot of them take advantage of it. But I think the biggest thing with the EAs is the differential that they received. If they're filling in for teachers out or, or you know, doing other stuff to get the differential, that gives them a big boost. So they're doing better off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of things, um, a couple of typos that I happen to find <laughs> uh, on, uh, on your page. And thank you very much also for doing the summary stuff. I think that really helps an awful lot rather than having to kind of piece through. I will say, though, that on a couple of them, the summary stuff is not quite, quite accurately labeled. So I did have to find it, you know, so. But that's okay, you know, that's not what actually goes in the contract. Uh, but I do have a couple things. On, uh, on page five of your summary, and of course this is in the contract as well, at the top of the page on item two, you indicate em APS employees will be limited to one calendar years, starting August 6th, it should be year. I found that too, Dave, I didn't get and, that. Uh, it's okay, <laughs> I understand you probably caught all these. Uh, and down on the bottom, when you, you have evaluations outside the work year, and then in a couple of the places, you always you, all, you repeat that, saying outside of the school work year, like in one and three, you repeat that, but in two, you don't. I would just suggest you take it out of one and three, because you've already, that's under the paragraph which says evaluations outside the work year, just to be consistent. Because I looked at that and I said, well, the SOPs, it's not outside the work year. I mean, it's not like, not that same language, but. Um, also, on uh, I, I I had a question on the Article Six, the table you had here. Um, I I know you broke out the marching band from what was there probably before. Now, as the band director, you probably had the marching band built in there, right? You said that you right. you've Correct. just broken it out. But but then you have things like band assistant, deck director. And then you say, uh, the, the asterisk says it's not district funded position. What does that mean exactly? The district doesn't fund the allocation for the school. The school has to fund it out of their school budget. School budget. So if I had a, if I had a band director and then I had somebody who did marching band, wh who wasn't me, I as a band director would earn less than my band assistant director. That doesn't seem quite right. I mean, the assumption here is the band director is also good doing the marching band, but I assume there could be a situation where that's not the case. Can we have a work history? Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, there are situations that are similar to that in, in the other area, like chorus assistant director, 
fact, the chorus assistant director right here makes more than the orchestra director. I what, don't understand that. Right. So um, the band director and the marching director are the same people. And well, they don't have to be the same. They people. don't have to be, but, but they are. So this was the big discussion we had around all of these. And when we started looking at this one, it started bleeding into everything else. So we decided to fix this one first and then go through and reanalyze everything. But the orchestra director and the, and the uh, well, of course, you know, you got a course direct, course assistant director, they, they, that's different. But uh, yeah, I guess the, the assistant director in other places makes less than the actual director. But mm -hmm. that was kind of an interesting question if I had because I have known situations where mm -hmm. the band director is not the person who does the marching band. Mm -hmm. Somebody else does that. And so the band director will be making less than the assistant band director, which is not, not what you want to have. Right, I think the idea was that it would be commensurate with the activities that, were, that fell outside of their regular duty day. So um, if they were indeed you know, both marching band and band director, um, then of course they would be able to receive the same or they would be able to combine the two differentials. Um, however, um, that, that's, that is a good assertion that you made. Yeah, I've known situations like that, so I'm just saying. Um, on the, uh, <clears throat> I did have uh, one little more serious question and that's on page 13. When you're talking about your examples of the raises that are going to occur, and you, you give a, a table that was on 2017-18, and you give a number for that, and then you say, it doesn't really matter which one of these you do, uh, then you say, for the next year, which is the 2018-19, you've got the new table, and you indicate like a person would go up a step, and then you look at that step uh, increase and you say, this is the amount of raise that you get. What I would like to know is, if I had the table for 2017-18, it also has a differential or an increase for a, an increase in the step. So by definition, if I still had the 2017-18 table, I would get an increase by being there another year, right? Mm -hmm. That's automatic. That I don't consider to be the same as a raise in the sense of above what we would normally get. Makes sense. Right. So what I would like to know is if I had 2017-18, just take the first level one example, um, uh, make 34,002. So what would they make in 2017-18 for, for next year? And then take that difference between that and what's in 2018-19. And that tells me what kind of raise they would get. And I think that's a little different number than the ones that we see here. Mm -hmm. Just to be transparent. I mean, I realize that it is going to be a 5.8% increase over the last year. But they would have gotten some of that automatically from the previous table they had. Okay. So um, wait a minute. A lot of the step increases were only a dollar difference because for T&E, for the state, we had to make it different for their years experience, years longevity or years of experience. So there's only a dollar difference in a lot of steps and that's what we were trying to correct by the new salary schedule. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. Is it, my point is I didn't know that. So the question is, is in all these 2017, 18, I mean, if the step is not any different going from one year to the next, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Because the tables in 2018-19 definitely have a difference in the step years, right? Why wouldn't 2017-18 have the difference in the step years? Not just a dollar. I'm talking about a normal, normal increase, right? Yeah. Uh, so is that because in 2017-18 we were going by some kind of a general idea of what raises would be in the future or, or what? No, I don't so, understand how that works. Sorry, I, I apologize. Um, uh, you know, um, the salary matrices are basically a snapshot in time, not supposed to be predictive of anything um, of what folks can expect to get because we're dependent on the legislature making allocations every single year. So it should only be um, looked at as this is what you are getting currently or to this year, 
right? So in, since we were able to finish early in negotiations, thankfully, people were able to see the salary matrix that they would be seeing for the following school year, of course, but oftentimes it's only been for that specific contract year. So, but, um, but you know that isn't gonna be the case. You know that when I'm looking at this and saying, oh, next year I should be able to get this. In other words, even though you say that, the point being is uh, you've got to have some kind of a reasonable expectation when you're wor doing work and saying, am I getting something more next year? And you realize, well, that may not be true, but you still kind of look at that and say, well, yeah, I, maybe I'm gonna get that, you know? So it, it is a little bit of a difference, you know? And it's not black and white to say, well, we, we've got all these, these raises now that are like that. I know you have to calculate it because in reality, that's what you got this year, and now you're gonna get this much next year, so that is a difference, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that. But, I'm just saying, uh, if, if you're looking at these kind of tables, uh, and that's the same way I would do it, for example, if I'm going down and recruiting in Houston, right, and I'm saying how many years experience you got, I'm gonna look at that table. And that table's gonna tell me that, right, for this year, how many, how many years I got experience. And I said, well, but I could, if I could get another couple of years experience, I'd be over here, right? Right, isn't that where I'd be? And maybe, and because we're allowing private experience, maybe they didn't understand that you could do that. Oh, we'll add in private. So I'm gonna be up here, right? You know, so you're using those steps to mean something, not just future stuff, but you're using them to try to place where you are. So they do have a meaning. Those steps have a meaning there. In the past, uh, 20 years ago, when raises were given out in the district, it was left up to the union in its entirety without district input on where to place that money on their salary schedule. So that's why the discrepancies are in certain areas. If you, the old salary schedule, step 25 to 30, it's around that were huge increases because they wanted people to be able to retire with a higher five. And yet then at the beginning, couple years, there was no increase. So we're trying to fix that slowly in the future, and it ended up staying like that for a long time, yeah. though. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, when, when you had no raises at all, then yeah. those steps didn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty good. Um, one, other, one other question. Here on page 15, I know you've got some interesting point, point decimal students. <laughs> uh, I, We've had principals ask us how to divide the kids. Yeah, I, I just wasn't sure exactly whether that meant we're, we're looking at, like for example, if I got several English classes, seven, eight, and I've got total number of students, then the average of the number of students in the classes would be such and such, and I can come up with a decimal point there. But I either have one or I don't have one, you know, usually. Although some of them may think they're only three quarters there. Um, <laughs> But uh, so is that what they're doing is averaging here, uh, you know? Correct, and if that is the average number and we wanted to keep So if I had 142 uh, English 7, 8 in one class and I had 140 in another one, that would still be within the average of 141.75. Correct. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I kind of understood that, yeah. Um, and then I did have the question about the high school seniors. I think uh, we're in deep doo-doo trying to uh, mm -hmm. say anything about what the seniors can or cannot do. Um, I think, again, some of them may well be taking college classes. Some of them may well be doing all kinds of things, but not being on campus. I mean, good in their education. Maybe they're taking CNM. Maybe they're going to CNM. You know, so I think that would be very difficult to to try to require any any particular thing uh, relative to those seniors. So, uh, and our, our court appear, uh, 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 our court person here is, is here. <laughs> I, I, I don't want you to feel like you have to say a lot here, Ellen, because again, I know you're tired and, and you've probably been through more than you really wanted to be today, uh, but you're welcome to say something. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Piercy, members of the board, that is true. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> Gabriella and Antonio made it back. So we had a lovely long day um, in court talking about uh, Los Padillas and Whittier and whether or not insisting that, sorry, I was rushing. 
insisting that the teachers at the schools had uh, yeah. evaluation designa designations based on VAM yeah, violated the injunction. I want to interrupt just a little bit. I want to interrupt just a little okay. bit because that really is not the topic. I want to make sure we're staying on topic of agendas. So, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, and I would love to hear that story. I really would. But I was thinking more about the contract itself and what we're talking about. So I, I didn't want to, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to violate the rules here. That we, we want to be careful what we're talking about in terms of agenda items here. So I, I just want to be pardon. sure. I would love to talk about the contract. Is yeah. that okay if I just do for one or two minutes? Uh, but that's a good. That's about a for public forum version, yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Piercy, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy, um, thank you very much, Simon, for coming because I was uh, trying to get back from Santa Fe. I just wanna say we had really productive contract negotiations this year. Um, we were able, because of our collaborative relationship uh, together as teams, we were able to settle salary negotiations before the end of May. Um, have you already said all this? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Tammy very much for all her hard work and um, Teresa also. And then I think we did great problem solving during the summer months and were able to address specific issues for specific constituents. And I'm very optimistic that in the next few years we're going to be able to do a lot more for our employees. Um, and make this the place that they want to work and they want to stay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I did have one question. It's a little bit on the line of what Board Member Muller again was interested in, uh, like how many voted for it, against it, or you know that kind of things. Um, I always, when I had somebody vote against it, and there weren't very many. You had 29, I think, in the teachers' unit. But one of the questions I, I always ask myself in those search maps is, what exactly were a main concern of of those that did vote no. In other words, what would they, you know, what is it exactly that you would say might be a, a concern that, that they had uh, with voting no? Dr. Piercy, members of the board, on our electronic vote system, we had a comment section, is there anything else you want to let the board know? But I, because I was out of town and I wasn't able to compile it for you, I will email it to you. Okay. I'm just interested, I'm not, not one way or the other on that. It's just that sometimes what I find is outliers have an interesting perspective that I hadn't thought about before. You know, in other words, it's not necessarily gonna change my mind about voting yes or no, but, but it is something that I might consider as, ah, oh, there's an issue I hadn't really thought about. And so that's kind of more of the idea. Um, and I've done this in my professional work a lot in terms of those kind of ideas. What, in other words, a lot of times in statistics, you throw the outliers out. And, I'm, and typically what I do is I wanna know why somebody's an outlier. Because you may well have found something I never even thought about. Uh, not that it's gonna maybe change the overall picture, but just from that point. So yeah, if you got a chance to, you know, to have some comments or thoughts, uh, yeah, uh, send them around and that'll be interesting to, if there's, if there's, particularly if there's a general idea of a few that kind of had a similar thing, or if there's something that you think is probably really, maybe important to follow up on, you know, that kind of a thing, so. Dr. Piercy, I will. I will tell you that what I have found over the years is um, when somebody votes no, it's because it wasn't everything that they thought it could be. Mm -hmm. And I know that people feel that way right now about salaries. Sure. Um, sometimes even though they understand the context of state funding and that we surpassed what the legislature allocated, they may uh, be unhappy about how it impacted them personally. Sometimes it's a specific person um, where contract language, like last year we were able to do something for the therapists that we didn't do for the social workers. And some social workers were upset that it didn't. So it, it's usually very personal and specific to the individual. Sure, yeah, I understand that, I understand that. And that's kind of not what I mean by that, but you know what I mean. Yeah, oh yeah, in fact we could probably say all of the teachers would say it really isn't enough. <laughs> and we in the board would say it really isn't enough. So, okay. that's. We know that. Okay, I'll uh, entertain a motion. Dr. Pierce, I just have oh, one yeah. comment to make. Okay, Board Member Patterson. Yeah. You, you know, being from the west side and looking at growth on the west side, 
we have large schools, right, large classrooms, and I'm concerned with the fact that we have waivers to increase classroom size. And I know this is something we're going to have to address with the lawsuit, and so I'm really concerned. I just wanted to, to make a comment with regard to that. This really concerns me. Our kids cannot learn in overcrowded classrooms. Um, board member um, Patterson. Not Peters, Patterson. Patterson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My head is not it's attached it's right now. It's we agree, and we were able to um, go from a 7% waiver to a 5% waiver yeah. when we were able to secure the funding. I um, Just to refresh everyone's memory, in uh, 2008 and 09 during the recession, they balanced the state budget by allowing waivers in class sizes. And so um, until we restore our funding at the state level to pre-recession levels, we are not gonna be able to restore our class sizes. And so it's gonna take um, another effort to bump it like uh, from seven to five and now from five back to where the state statute says it should be. Okay, thank you, Ellen, appreciate it. I'll, I'll entertain a motion for approval. I'll make a motion. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank no. you very much, appreciate it. Mine was no. Uh, she has a no. Okay, uh, we'll go on to the item D, briefing on the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials in Leo, uh, Education Leadership and Public Policy Academy. That's just a discussion, and Liz, you have the floor with the PowerPoint. Right, you know, I'll make this quick. Um, and, and it's a mouthful just the, just saying the name of the institute. So, <laughs> But I participated in the first annual National Education Leadership and Public Policy Academy hosted by the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials and the Latino Policy and Politics Initiative at, the U, at UCLA. You'll see some of the photos up here. I don't think I'm in any of them, but I swear to God I was there. So. <laughs> Um, but it was a, a three-day intensive convening that brought together about 60 different Latino state legislators, county and municipal officials, uh, higher education trustees, and school board members to learn about effective public policies that support Latino families and communities. Um, the curriculum was designed to strengthen our governance capacity in critical areas such as education, economic development, criminal justice, and immigration. Um, and improving opportunities for Latinos with special attention to intersections across gender and age so that we are better equipped to contribute to the economic success of the country. Um, some of the topics that were addressed during the Institute uh, included uh, challenges and opportunities for Latinos in the 21st century, academic attainment trends for Latino students, uh, dismantling the school to prison pipeline, increasing college access and opportunities for Latino males, um, we did a study of a um, Fruitville, Oakland, which was a case study on transportation and community economic development, mm -hmm. um, improving public trust in communities while addressing public safety, collateral consequences, um, the blurred lines between immigration and criminal law, and restoring hope through uh, re uh, reintegration. Um, so some of those highlights in reference to like academic attainment trends for Latino students were that Latino students are the second largest student population in the K through 12 public school system, ensuring that student populations excel in the attainment of a high school degree and is prepared to be career or college ready is a key economic priority for the country and to gauge how well students are prepared post high school, policymakers must understand how to navigate the various data sources available to them um, so one of the things that I brought along is what we learned at the kids first workshop and all of the different data sources that we use uh, to make decisions. Um, the Fruitville Oakland case study on transportation and economic development um, was where policymakers have the opportunity to better understand the effect of environmental stress on the lives of families and young children and identify strategies to support well-being and what that included was a, um, it was like a, very similar to what we have downtown, so they built it around a transportation center, so they built housing, they built charter schools, community centers, um, access to healthcare, 
so they, they did a case study, you know, 10 years later, how they're doing. And um, so it was really interesting. And again, I, I brought everything on a, on a drive for <laughs> you guys to take a look at, because it, it was incredibly overwhelming these three days. Um, the, um, one of the other highlights was improving public trust in communities while addressing public safety. And so at the national level, criminal justice reform has uh, paid increasing attention to the role of law enforcement in improving public safety through community-based policing, <laughs> procedural justice, eliminating poverty penalties associated with court fees, uh, restorative justice, and police accountability. Um, and, 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 I, and I included some more highlights, um, but I just, I really wanted to say that at the end of those three days, what felt really good once again, and we learn this every time we go to national conferences, is how well positioned Albuquerque Public Schools is and how we are addressing a lot of the things that we discussed at this conference and how we do have the restorative justice uh, program in place. We do address equity and engagement. We do work with community schools and we do have an immigrant and refugee department in contact. Um, so a lot of the things that we had discussion around those three days, thank God I had uh, examples to talk about because we, again, I just felt so good after those three days that we are, um, you know, <laughs> that, we, you know, not to say that we are ahead of the game, but we are definitely in the game and we are addressing these issues and, and we take what we do incredibly serious and, um, and I love the fact that they pointed out uh, such an emphasis on data analysis. I knew that would be right up Dr. Bowman's um, <laughs> alley, but um, it, was, it was incredibly interesting. And again, I could give you highlights on, on every workshop, but incredibly interesting. And I did bring back all the PowerPoint presentations and the handouts for you guys, because it's a lot of information to take in, and I would highly recommend you spend the time doing it when, when you have availability, so. Um, I could do without LA traffic though. Um, I like to rent a car because I like to be in control. I'll never do that again in LA. So. <laughs> but what it, you did tell me, but what an incredible opportunity again to be in the room with those uh, 60 different elected officials from, from everywhere, from Florida to New York to New Jersey, Michigan. I mean, it, it was incredible. And, and I felt really proud of Albuquerque Public Schools and what we have to offer our community. So thank you. Very good, thank you, Liz. Great report. Uh, any questions from the board? Any thoughts? Just what uh, was what was your one best kernel of wisdom that you gained? Take away. Take away. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I had a, a lot of aha moments, and a lot of them had to do with statistics, especially in reference to youth incarceration. I mean, so that was um, disappointing, but. It wasn't necessarily an aha moment, but I walked away thinking most recently how um, uh, board member Peggy talked about going to the graduation of our kids who are incarcerated. Do we have dual credit opportunities for those kids? Sure. We do? Okay, that, um, so it wasn't an aha moment, but it was definitely a question that I walked away with thinking, are we offering our students that are incarcerated uh, an opportunity to also earn their college degree while while being there, but I, um, yeah, my aha moments were definitely based around youth incarceration and, um, you know, young men of color uh, um, in the high rates. So, and the other aha moment was, again, what we already have in place and what we're doing was such a positive thing. Thank you very much. Any other comments, thoughts? Thank you, Liz, appreciate that greatly. No problem. Uh, we'll go on to the approval of the consent calendar items. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. We'll go on to board member comments. Uh, I'll start down here with board member Armillo. Great, well, again, I just wanna ensure that uh, Mrs. Taylor and her husband w uh, were addressed this evening um, before they left and as well as uh, Ms. Yolanda Armijo, who was here um, at the last meeting as well. So I know that she had a similar concern. Um, my really uh, only comment in reference to just kind of giving you the update on Naleo was, uh, I wanted to point out the difference between the Albuquerque Journal's editorial board and their beat reporters and their writers. And um, I, I wanted to point out that there is a big difference between the editorial board and the beat reporters. And then I honestly think that our beat reporters and writers are trying to do um, a fair, you know, they're doing their best to be fair and accurate in their reporting. 
So that, that was really the only comment that I had this evening that I wanted to point out. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Patterson. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Reedy, for your report. Always look forward to listening to what we're doing in the district. Thank you. And um, let me see what I have here. And I hope we can take care of the Taylor, the, the folks from Chaparral. I know that the district will take care of that. Um, I know, and we will follow up with you on that. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to, to, to thank um, Gerald Shea. The reason uh, the frosty conditions here no longer exist uh, <laughs> is because of Mr. Shea. He was able to check the room, and so we can now be comfortable in here. And thanks to him, uh, uh, you know, from m &O, as well as Mr. Dufay, because of them, this room is now very comfortable. And I really appreciate that. I wore a sweater and brought a jacket. And I was ready to, <laughs> and yeah, there was no warning about how it would feel, but this is great. Thank you so much. Appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member uh, Yolanda. <clears throat> um, I just, I want to say um, thank you to all the individuals that are associated with um, the negotiations work that went on with all the union, uh, all the union work. I think it's a, it represents what we mean by local control and that whole thing of like a community-based approach to how we address how we're going to work as a community. Um, I belong to a professional association, the National Association of Social Workers, and yet that association would never bargain on my behalf with the school district. And so it would require me to be part of that school district uh, to talk about what my interests are and what I would need as a professional. So I think um, what I like about the unions is that it takes into account the individuals that are going to work for our community. Mm -hmm. And it demonstrates the, the willingness and the partnership between um, administration and those that are going to be on the front line, right? Um, and that's what it's all about. Um, I know with my jobs that I've had, I've had the opportunity to be employed at the state level, and I've been a union member uh, when I was there, and I totally appreciated the bargaining unit because oftentimes, even as a social worker at the state level, didn't feel like my interests would be met just with my association. So I know it's hard work, and I know it takes a lot of commitment, but I think it's the partnership that makes it work. Uh, because if there's a willingness to sit at the table together and to talk about what's going to make it work and how can we support uh, this, it's going to make us a much stronger community and a much stronger workplace for everyone. So thank you uh, for representing the folks that are represented in that process. I really appreciate that it's extended beyond teachers. Uh, when I was with APS, it was just teachers. <laughs> and so I appreciate that it's gone further than that. My mother was a long time educational assistant. She retired from APS as an educational assistant. And um, she would have greatly appreciated having had an opportunity to have somebody bargain on her behalf. So, so thank you. I think that was tremendous. And, and in terms of just thinking about the, um, the differences in leaves and the importance of the Family Medical Leave Act. I understand that as well, too, having been an individual who had to benef who benefited from that because when my husband was ill, I was on FMLA. And now, as a person who's taking care of my mother, I really appreciate having FMLA uh, to support me as I'm going through my work as well. So I, it's very complicated and it's very difficult, but I totally appreciate the reason why it needs to happen. And so again, thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Garcia. Thank you. Uh, first, I thought I wasn't going to say anything. Uh, but I do have to acknowledge a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I had the pleasure of attending the Economic Forum uh, this past week um, and uh, was able to listen to the superintendent's professional uh, presentation. Um, <laughs> It was very interesting, I, I noted this when I was there, that uh, you couldn't get people to come inside the room to get the session started at the beginning. And then at the end, uh, because of the presentation, and it was profound, um, you couldn't get people uh, to leave. There was a lot of uh, discussion, um, and it looked like people were on point. 
and it had to do very much with, uh, I think, the leveraging that you did and the words that you chose. Uh, you're always uh, way beyond being diplomatic. Uh, you have, uh, you, you basically are a class act is the only way I know how to say it, so thank you. And I want to acknowledge also the associate superintendents for your hard work uh, in the last period of time. I've thought a lot about it. And it strikes me that I don't, I don't know a harder working group. I'm sure there are lots of people who work very hard, but uh, I just want to say that any time I uh, call one of the associates, they get back to me and then it, just in a matter of, you know, hours or minutes and uh, are very professional and listen to my concerns and uh, get back to me about uh, the issues or concerns that I have and we come to an understanding. Uh, I appreciate that. And I do, again, appreciate you, uh, Board Member Montoya Cordova, uh, for what you said about the collaboration on behalf of uh, the district that's uh, been able to be achieved at this, uh, at this district. You know, it's, it's quite remarkable, actually. And I think we all know that uh, part of the reason that we've had so many challenges is just because we've been underfunded for so many years. Um, my hope is that uh, we can actually move forward in the next period of time, but I don't think it's going to happen unless people get together and register to vote and vote. Uh, we really need to make sure that we send a clear mes message that uh, people are behind our public education system. Um, and while I very much appreciate uh, Elizabeth's comments uh, about making a distinction between the staff at the journal who do the reporting and the editorial board, uh, it's hard to not um, be somewhat uh, tainted, I think. In part, I feel like a lot of what gets put together is a message that essentially what looks to me like uh, makes uh, the journal very much a spokesperson for PED. And I don't think those uh, policies are such that uh, they've been useful to us, whether it's the grading of schools or the evaluations of teachers. And the land blasting of APS as an institution, I think uh, I take big issues with that. And we have to uh, stand up for what's right because our democracy is at stake. And um, there's a lot to be uh, said. I've called for a dialogue and have never, ever received uh, any kind of invitation to sit down and talk. Um, I don't need to be lectured to, but I do want us to be able to come to terms. And perhaps maybe at the end of this administration, we could actually move forward in a way that we haven't thus far. Um, I have uh, taken great offense by a number of things that have been put out there in the name of uh, the media. Uh, and the offense I take mostly is that uh, we're attacking our own community without really talking about what really is going on. So thank you. Thank you, Board Member Peterson. Let's see. I'll just start with, I'll just say I appreciate my fellow board members and I'll just say yes to the things that have already been said. Um, the, the presentation at the economic forum was really outstanding and I think whether or not people pay attention to it, um, people heard good stuff. The only thing that I'll say, and, I, and this is only because I have this conversation with constituents, people don't get that it's more than just the, that category of direct instruction that's direct support for students. And so every time, I, we say 67% is direct instruction, and that's teacher and DAs in the classrooms. But just saying that one more sentence, and then that other 20% are people who are working directly with students, just not in the classroom. And it includes like, anyway, it was, it was not only well received, but I think that it says as a district, the concern for children and students and what happens is immense. And, and they, I think it was sort of a little tap on the shoulder to them. 
that that's the case, so thank you. Um, one of the things that I know just from, from the years that I was teaching, this goes to the salary schedule, and I don't know what the solution is because every time there's just a chunk of money trying to figure out where it needs to go and how to divide it up. And some years it's been people at the top who have gotten who have gotten more. Sometimes it's been people, entry level people that have gotten more. But I know that over the years, my, when I think about the years that I was teaching, over 35 years, I ended up retiring at 35 without the same standard of living based on my salary as people who had come before me 30 years. That when you look at what teacher salaries used to be, teacher salaries used to support families. And that never, and, and I know that there's a whole history to why the salary schedule is designed the way it is. And some of it I really understand, and some of it I think, you know, man, if we could go back in time and redo it, it, it might be good. But it was never a guarantee. It was never, if I was on step 19, it was never a guarantee that what was on the schedule for step 20 would be my income when I hit 20 years. And very rarely over, over the years has that been the case. So each generation of incoming teachers sort of loses a little bit in terms of the standard of living. So, and I think the tier system, the licensure system, was an attempt to, to address that, to say let's move everyone up, let's, and, I, and automatically supporting what I know Senator Stewart er, introduced last session in terms of saying let's just move those base tiers for everyone. Let's put who's at tier three, who's at um, 50 now, they should just start at 60, move up, you know, and move everyone that $10,000. So I know there's some effort that we can support in Santa Fe to say, let's look, how do we make the whole profession move forward? Because, and it's not out of ill intent at the district level, it's been the reality of income. And one of the things that just, and I, I'm really echoey. I don't know why I'm so echoey. Moving. Okay. Um, I think last year when we had that massive, or whatever year it was, when we had the massive cut, there was incredible intention to keep it away from the classroom and people and administrative level folks took a huge cut as as we have more money coming into the district i think we need to be equally careful about thinking about what do we need to reinstate because we're going to burn people out in the administration and people can't keep going and and yet, what can we still do to make sure we keep focusing on class size and on the building level instruction? And it's, it's going to be a push-pull because I know people are hurting at, within the administration. And at the same time, the class size, we've, we've got to look at that. So all of those things, it goes back to partly what we're lobbying for, what we can be really explicit about in terms of saying this is the need. I mean, I think I've always, it's been a puzzlement. We have to recognize that teachers are human beings and they have sick kids, they have sick, sick parents, they, have, they get cancer. People have to be able to take care of themselves and their families. So how do we solve that? We solve that by having sufficient staffing in buildings. There have been periods of time when we've had long-term subs or permanent subs in a building. 
And so how do we let people be human and take care of their families and still take care of the classroom. We do that by making sure we have s sufficient staffing within schools so that we minimize what the effects are. Um, if we have permanent subs in the building who know kids, who know instruction, who, know, who are part of the staff, then all of a sudden we can minimize what the impact on children in the classroom are and still respect the needs of human beings that work in the district. So hopefully sufficient funding is on the way and we can start looking at, at some of the realities, but always keep an eye on making it possible for people to work long term for this district and feel like it's something they want to and can do and, and still keep always directing as much resources to the buildings as we can. And hopefully we'll have sufficient funding someday. I'm waiting for the day. Um, <laughs> trying to think if there is anything else. Off to a start this year, thank you, and echoing the appreciation for the associate superintendents who are out there all the time trying to problem solve and help and support. So thank you for that. Board Member Rolla Aragon. Um, first, we want to make sure that little Reese is taken care of. So I'm sure that everybody went out and made sure that that's, that's going to happen because we can't do that to our, our little ones. Um, another thing that I just want to put out there is um, at our last meeting when we had a lot of people talking about the newcomer program, um, the one that started at La Mesa, and hopefully that's going to go well, and we are behind that and supporting that. But there is a great need for those um, a newcomer program that is going to help those high school students, so we don't have too much time um, with them in our schools. So we want to make sure that we do the best we can. So hopefully we're looking at that kind of program um, to hopefully start by uh, hopefully next school year. Um, and as far as um, as unions, everybody knows what I think. You have a right to, to join them. Um, but according to the Bureau of Labor, um, there are 790,000 workers in New Mexico. Um, 63,000 of those have a union negotiate for them. 52,000 are members of a union, which is less than 7%. Um, Bargaining with somebody else's money, with the public's money, is not something that even FDR wanted um, us to do. Um, I know when you're out there in the private sector, your uh, boss decides by looking at your work who is going to get paid more. Um, that's what we do with our business, and that's what most businesses do. Um, there are the exceptional workers who deserve that exceptional pay. Um, as far as bargaining, I want to bargain. I would always want to bargain for myself and not leave that to someone who doesn't know anything, anything about me. Um, I know unions speak as if they're speaking for the majority when they're really speaking for the minority as we looked at many of these numbers when you have 489 people that they're negotiating for and there's only 120 that are um, dues paying members so um, that's something hopefully with the Janus decision bargaining will finally return to the um, individual worker where it um, it belongs um, people know themselves better and everyone um, who is a worker out there knows what they're knows what they're worth Everybody is not worth the same. They are not worth the same amount. And we all know this. And we like to get paid for what we do. And it stifles people and it clips their wings when they're not able to be the very best and get paid for being the very best. Thank you, Dr. Piercy. Thank you. Um, I really have very, very little to say here, but I, I do want to compliment uh, the La Mesa uh, uh, church who gave us this last uh, uh, Sunday a, uh, a uh, check for 
$1,500 for our uniforms for Little Mesa Elementary School and actually another $500, which probably came because people contributed to that uh, after we were there. Uh, we had, of course, the superintendent was there. We had Gabriel, uh, Gabriella Blakey, our associate superintendent for Zone 4 was there, and our principal, Ara Akabel, who was the principal at, uh, at uh, La Mesa Elementary School, and myself. Uh, and I think they were very appreciative of the fact that APS took a little bit of time to send some of, the, some of their administrative folks there to, to actually welcome them and to thank them for their outreach and mission. Um, I'm a big believer in, in organizations uh, helping out with our schools, and that's one organization that clearly has a great mission for La Mesa. They've been there for a long time. They've been a dedicated to that school. So I greatly appreciate that. Uh, I also ran into a, a Nancy Pauley, who is a UNM professor, and she gave me several interesting research articles on why art is so important to our students. <laughs> I love it. Just let you know that I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna put that out, send it to you guys again. Uh, <clears throat> I I know a lot of the research, but again, it's always nice to have somebody else. And uh, she kind of cornered me a little bit and says, I I know you're kind of you know an arts guy, and I just thought I had to tell you about this research we're doing. And so I appreciate that a lot. Um, and I uh, echo. Uh, the board members' comments on the Economic Forum did a great job. I think, again, that's part of what we, we need to do in terms of putting out what we're doing uh, in a matter of fact and a polite and a calm manner of what we're doing. And you do a great job in that, so thank you very much. Um, I'm very appreciative of all of our, our staff and our unions and what they're doing for, their, for, their, for our people, for our employees. I'm glad that we could have some raises. Uh, I don't think they're enough. Uh, and to kind of follow up on the, uh, on the funding ruling that uh, uh, our judge made in the Yasa, Yasi, Yasi lawsuit ruling, um, we have a framework now at our MRI schools. And I'm hopeful that that framework is, is on the basis of the fact that we know time on task is what the issue is in a lot of these students. So we've added school days, we've added hours to the day, we've added particular kind of programs like our Genius Hour, which is experiential learning concepts, um, and we've spent somewhere between a million and a half, two million dollars per school to do that. So if the legislature wants to know what's a possible solution for some of these funding things for our underserved, underserved kids and schools that have a large percentage of our underserved kids, uh, there's a model that you might want to think about. And so that gives you kind of a baseline. In other words, when people say, well, how much funding are you really talking about? I think we ought to have kind of a little bit of a baseline for well, what would that really mean, particularly for Albuquerque. And I don't know how many of our schools could probably benefit, probably all of our schools could benefit from a longer day and a longer and more days, uh, no doubt. But if I said, well, maybe 50 of our schools, I mean, if I took the CSI schools, the MRI schools, maybe some of the TSI schools, and says, okay, we're gonna apply that same kind of model. So we're spending a million and a half, two million dollars for 50 schools, that's 100 million dollars, okay? We have 25% of the students in this state. So that's 400 million dollars. There's a baseline, okay? So it gives you something to kind of think about, right? In other words, it's not a billion dollars, and it's not just a hundred million dollars. It's, it's a little more than that, but it's a little less than that. So <laughs> let's start thinking about that rather than having planning meetings and committee meetings and more meetings and more talk and less do. Uh, you know, that's what we end up doing with this. So the question is, is maybe we ought to be a little more proactive about that kind of an idea not that everybody wants to do what we're doing, but the concept of adding days, adding hours is, is basic. It's called time on task, and then building in experiential learning, building in the community schools concept, so we get the community built in, right? So we're expanding our capacity into the community with our businesses and so forth, see? Those are all the kinds of ideas that we know work. We know that works, so I'm interested to see how that works with our MRI schools, but that doesn't mean you gotta show me, 
you know, 45% increase in proficiency or something. I mean, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the general idea of how we really educate our students and how that's going to make a difference. So, so I think that's something that, uh, that we ought to talk to our legislators about. We ought to talk to our uh, next governor about. And we ought to talk to uh, uh, our constituents about in other districts to say, hey, here's some ideas and thoughts, and maybe why don't we get behind this and start having, having some real uh, uh, detailed uh, discussions about what could be done and not just a lot of high-level uh, um, planning. Uh, so implementation, I like it a lot. So thank you very much. I uh, appreciate everybody here, and thank you. Uh, appreciate Ellen, you hustling back. You, I'm, I'm not sure you needed to do that, but I appreciate you doing that. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'll go on to announcement of upcoming board meetings. Uh, next board of education meeting will be Wednesday, September 5th, uh, here at 5 o'clock. Next spatial board meeting will be Monday, September 24th, 7.30 a.m. in the De DeLeo Martin community room. And we have a consideration for approval to convene into executive session. Pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, NMSA 1978-1015-AH7, for the purpose of discussing matters pertaining to pending litigation, an attorney-client privilege related to Catherine T. Goldberg plaintiff versus John Sane and the Albuquerque Public Schools, defendants D-202-CV-218-04233. It's a discussion action. So do I have a motion to do that? So moved. I have a second, and uh, we'll take a roll call. Yes. 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 And with that, we will move to the DeLeo Martin room. Thank you. Oh, it's not there. Here you go, Yolanda. Yeah.